fans of uh, kidneys. We're live at Plaster High School. Anytime Mr. Schroeder starting class. Not in this hotline. Can you hold, please? Nice. nice. Love that. <laughs> That's why I call. Okay. Number two. Why office. would the nurse have a red pen? To draw blood, of course. Oh, tough crowd. Very tough crowd. Yeah. All the way. <laughs> Thanks for setting that up. Oh, that usually does one a day. There usually is one a day, but that is more than one. Oh, yeah. sweet. All right. So before we turn it over to the good Dr. Bonds, uh, let me give you a little Sarkis. study guide for uh, for the kidney test on Tuesday. Kidney test. There you go. Oh, we're taking a test. Uh, Tuesday. Okay. Ooh, I can do that. Can we do the kidney test? Uh, uh, I can do that. So, sweet. This is good stuff. Yes, this thing's being filmed in a high school. Somebody asked if this is being filmed in a high school. Yes, yes, yes it is. Placer High School. Bowman's Capsule. That's why that takes me back. Oh, my goodness. Bowman's Capsule. So we're reading. What are we reading? This the is what's going to be on the kidney test. Because this is an anatomy and physiology class. Mr. Schroeder's anatomy and physiology class. The loop of Henley. The loop the of proximal. Henley. Okay, let me, let me turn this around until we really get All going. Right. So I can see. So, uh, I'll put this. You can turn your uh, mic around. So yeah, turn questions on there. I'll put this in the Google Classroom. Rough right now because we're just getting ready in class. Mr. Schroeder's handing things out to the students, like the kidney review sheet. All right. Omar wants to know how we're doing. We're doing well, Omar. Thanks for asking. Bonnie's here. Hey, Bonnie. Oh, here we go. Couple of people that you may know because this is the uncle and father of Ethan Vaughn. Uh, no, no, cousin. no, sorry, no. cousin, cousin, uh, that's right, cousin You promoted me. Can't be both uncle and father, well, that's... <laughs> <laughs> Not in California, <laughs> legally. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> more, more dad, you do have family from Arkansas. Yes, the bonds are twisted. Oh, it's so sad. It's a convoluted no, family stop. tree. <laughs> it branches, it does, we promise. It's different families. Okay, all right. <laughs> anyway, uh, so they're going to talk a little bit about their um, practice. They, they, they uh, practice here in North Auburn. Uh, it is a, they've been doing this for a number of years now, so I'm really grateful to have them come back. Both of them are Placer grads. Let's give it to yeah. Placer High School. Yeah. Yes. Go Hillman. Go Hillman. Show my shirt. And, uh, so again, Show your we're going to talk a little bit about... Uh, well, Hillman we'll, shirt on. We'll tell you a little bit about them. Okay. okay. Sure. Thank you guys again. Um, so, so where to start? Um, so I'm Dr. Gwen Vaughn. This is Dr. Mark Vaughn. Um, we practice, uh, we do family practice. We practice family practice. We, we do. Uh, family medicine. They don't like the word practice anymore. Apparently that has a bad connotation. Depends on who you ask. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, so we do a little bit of everything. Uh, so we see kids uh, through adults and grandparents, um, every age, and treat just about every condition. That's, that's kind of the cool thing about being family doctors. Cradle to grave. We get to do everything. Um, yeah, so... Um, Let's see, how about you tell them how you got into medicine and how you got here? Okay, uh, got I did not start pre-med in college. I was actually a broadcasting major and had a blast being on radio and television and things like that, which, as you can see, I'm still doing. I can't get yeah. away from it. But um, during the early part of my second year of college, uh, sitting, talking to Leanne, my wife, she was my, starting to be my girlfriend back then. We were talking about all sorts of stuff as people do when this late at night and you sit in the car just talking about stuff and talking about life and yes we were we were talking we were about <laughs> what you do in a car late at night <laughs> in college that, that time we were at <laughs> that time okay. anyway so we were talking <laughs> and uh, got inspired she had a cousin who was pre-med and I thought wow that's cool I, I thought I could do that and I thought back to walking on the the stadium here uh, after graduation, walking on the grass, across the track, going to my brother's house, which is actually now. Uh, do you know? Did they live there when you were? Yeah. Before you? Okay. He was just a baby when they I was moved. A baby. But yeah. the 
what, what do you call that parking lot? The lower parking lot? Senior parking lot. Senior, no, well, no, it was senior it parking lot when I was here. But the one over the there. Lower parking lot. That was actually where his parents lived when he was a baby, and I graduated from Placer. And so it was actually on Placer's campus that my, on Placer. one of my brothers, uh, Bob, said, you can do anything you want. And that was just kind of this little seed that went into my mind that stayed there for years. And then uh, one time when it came out was when uh, I was talking to Leanne and heard that her cousin that was at our college was a, uh, a pre-med. And I thought, that is cool. And I thought, maybe I could do that. And then overnight, it turned into, I'm going to be a doctor. Actually, which I, makes sense if you know him well. I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if any caffeine was involved in that. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I often tell people that I feel like I was in the process of this, called by God to be a doctor. And I still feel that way. And went, changed all my classes, sold my books back to the bookstore, bought new books, and within two years I was taking the MCAT and then interviewing at medical schools and started medical school as soon as I finished. Oh, Ethan can help us, please. Be our camera come, person. Come I, I have it in a stable Maybe. position with a tripod right now. Everybody, please welcome Ethan to the show. <laughs> so, uh, what, since you're going to be doing it, we'll just. You know, this because we don't have any permission to have any students in. But when you, when you can, you know, hold it in a stable position, do. When, when we're moving around, try, try to be stable. With it. All right. And if there's any really, really good comments, pass them along. Okay. <laughs> So that's my story. What about you, Dr. Gwing? Uh So mine starts uh, a little before that. So when I was a... Um, was there any uh, inspiration from any of the Vaughn brothers involved in your story? There, not, well, yeah, not my brothers, but <laughs> yeah. So, so when I was a, uh, in junior high, uh, I was going to Evie King. No, well, I have a shout out for that one. But um, <laughs> yeah, so I was going to Evie King, and uh, it was some break. <laughs> uh, I, Christmas break, spring break, something like that, and, um, and you were home from, from medical school at the time, and you brought this video home. Uh, it was a Nova special. I bet you guys don't even know what Nova specials are, but, but PBS. Oh, look, oh, you did, wow, house. that's right. You guys are, they probably still show them in like biology classes, huh? Hashtag uh, Nova. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, so there's this Nova special uh, titled, um, so you want to be a doctor, it kind of just kind of lays everything out. And you, and you, you had that and um, played it and I watched it and I was sold. I was like, that's what I'm going to do when I grow up. So I was in junior high um, and so I didn't need to go change a major or anything like that, but I just kind of set the trajectory of my life in, in that order. So, so when I came to Placer, I um, took about every science class offered here. Um, Mr. Schroeder was one of my teachers for biology. Yep, so we can credit him to right. this success. Um, <laughs> uh, and uh, I went to um, Point Loma Nazarene University um, where yeah, I did a biochem major, which is a, a double major. Um, just because I thought it'd be great to get into medical school, now I know. I wasn't that awesome. Yeah, now I know that I could have probably relaxed a little on that. but. Uh, and done something else, but that's what I did. And, and I uh, was in San Diego and didn't get to enjoy San Diego as much as most people do because I was at that double major, but I enjoyed it uh, nonetheless. And um, then I um, interviewed all over, uh, got accepted at my top choice, uh, actually got waitlisted. Um, in, the, in the process of going to medical school, you go through this process of interviews and uh, applications and um, I got waitlisted, which means they had their whole class uh, all figured out, and um, I was just there in case somebody didn't show up or did or decided to go somewhere else. So it was, I think, about two weeks before school began that I got the call, uh, and, and they said, "Hey, you, you, um, you still up for it?" And I was like, "Yeah, uh, of course." So I, um, I don't work everything out. So I, I went to Loma Linda, uh, which is also in California, down in Southern California, and um, yeah, enjoyed it. I mean, every step of the way, it was one of those things where. Like, it was just confirmed, this is absolutely what I should be doing. I enjoyed it. Uh, it was, it's hard work, um, but it was, it was fun learning all that. So, yeah. He mentioned a little bit about the medical school application process and yeah. acceptance and things like that. I applied to about 13 medical schools, 13, 14 maybe, and got interviews at three in, uh, let's see, where were the three I interviewed? Oh, Loma Linda was one of the ones I interviewed at, and 
Creighton University in Omaha, Nebraska, and St. Louis University in St. Louis, and got accepted at St. Louis University. So that's where I went. Okay, okay what's next on your agenda? <laughs> that's, yeah. Uh, any questions about that process? Because that's, that's probably... Um, oh, yeah, follow-up questions. Yeah. Um, you guys, anybody, I guess, want to be a doctor or be in the medical field? Any? Yeah. This okay. is the class. Cool. Yeah. All cool. right, excellent. Yeah. Where did you find the most Turmoil. Well, I know his answer. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, but for me, what you're referring to. Uh, your, yeah, your residency and how. Your oh, first that. Residency. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, it's so bad that he yeah. repressed it. Um, <clears throat> uh, medical school is hard. Um, I actually uh, didn't have any. Um, emotional turmoil or anything like that, didn't go through any depression, although it does happen because you're um, so stressed through these times. But um, during medical school, uh, it is so much information and so hard uh, that you're constantly working and that can become draining and it's just, it's just difficult. The, um, the metaphor that they use to, that when you're getting into medical school and trying to learn everything is trying to drink water out of a fire hydrant. There is that much information coming out at, at you, and you're just trying to grasp and learn everything you can. Um, so, so yeah, you do get it, but it, it, it and it feels like that. You're just essentially, uh, you know, trying to get trying to get it, trying to pass the test. Yeah. Um, yeah. I was a uh, um, an A student all through, even in even in college. I, college was not that hard for me. Um, oh, uh, you say you also had a D in your high school. That's right. I had. Uh, I did. Got a five on the, the calc, AP calc test. Um, so so it, it was never hard. And then I got to medical school, and you were there with the top, how many, well, the top less than 1% of people in, uh, in college. So, so you're essentially level with everyone else uh, at, at, for essentially the first time in my life. Big leagues. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so it, it was difficult. Um, uh, but you put your head down, and that's essentially your job. You know, you do that uh, as a job. You go, you go to school in the morning, and then in the afternoon you study. <laughs> That's what you do, um, and, and you make it. You learn how to do it. A lot of people experience this change from high school to college, where they go from having it down, how you do it, and then they get to college, and wow, it's tough. Now I have to learn how to study differently, and uh, especially people who are in science majors or yeah. something else that requires a certain type of study that is a little bit more rigorous. And then when you go from that to medical school, it's that same exponentially harder yeah, leap different. of, wow, mm -hmm. I left all the competition there and did well, so I was able to get it to this level, and now I'm at this level of performance and competition. And it inspires you to be at that level, to perform at that level, study that much. Yeah. What was your time of turmoil? I hated residency. I love medical school. Even at the worst time of medical school, and I, I can tell you, Probably our worst time in medical school uh, was on a VA rotation, VA Veterans Affairs Hospital in North St. Louis, which is kind of isolated because it's not a neighborhood that you voluntarily drive in other than to go to the rotation you have to. Uh, it's not where all the neat stuff in St. Louis is located. And you have residents over you who are mean. <laughs> and on a weekend at the VA, it like shuts down uh, it like has regular business hours, so evenings and weekends, um, you, you can't even go to a cafeteria to get something to eat. You just have to kind of try to get a tray that a patient wasn't using somehow <laughs> to be able to even eat when you're staying there over the weekend. And you spend the night, uh, and there's no one to talk to but really sick patients who need to stop smoking. Because <laughs> then they're going to lose the two fingers they still have to hold the <laughs> cigarette. Uh, Out of there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, through their, through their tray. It's hard to, to hold a cigarette in, in your tracheostomy when you're losing fingers because you're still smoking. Yeah. Not, to, not, Anyways. To, not, <laughs> not to say anything bad about veterans, it's just my experience with the patients in this particular VA hospital, that's what I came away with. Smoking, <laughs> other other VA hospitals, not Don't like start. that. But that's, this one, that's the takeaway. to tell you what, what this particular VA hospital was like. And, uh, so I just remember being so terribly lonely and calling my wife on the phone, uh, wishing I could be home on the weekend instead of just being in this sad place with 
a piece of white bread with gravy on it for my Aww. lunch. <laughs> that, that, that was not the worst part. That, <laughs> that was medical school, and I, I still said, horrible. I am a medical student, and I love it. I'm learning. During, in the midst of that, I still love being a medical student because of learning medicine and being able to practice medicine. That part I loved. Residency, I got depressed, and I was sad, and I didn't like what I was doing. And uh, I, it's my second, ro second rotation. My second rotation was pediatric surgery. And on that rotation, I logged a 136 hour week in the hospital. So, you know, do a little bit of math and figure out what that was. <laughs> I also remember having a 36 hour shift straight with no sleep, working constantly, not ever having a break from it, except to, you know, grab a little meal here and there uh, from, you know, six or seven in the morning, whatever it was, until six the next night, and then, or six the next evening when I got to go home and got to do that again the next day until I was on call again on the following day because yeah. every third night you're spending the night in the hospital on that rotation. Not as bad as it is for the surgical uh, pediatric surgery fellows who during the two years of their fellowship, one of them was always in that hospital. So the only time they could leave is if the other guys covered them. So it was pretty much every other night they moved into the hospital, moved back home to their family, back and forth. Then, the th it must have been the third rotation was cardiology. And I was not feeling up to what I was being uh, told to do. You were, you're given this, pre at least when I did it, there's this pressure not to call the resident who's over you with questions. You're supposed to be the doctor. You know, this is right after you graduate from medical school. You're supposed to be the doctor. You're supposed to know. And you're supposed to handle these situations in a cardiac ICU, uh, the highest rated and uh, most um, celebrated cardiac ICU in five states. And you're the guy, <laughs> fresh out of medical school, who is the first line when the nurses call with a question about what to do with the patient who just had surgery that day and now is having their blood pressure go down and you don't know why until you listen to their heart and hear a new murmur that wasn't there before because their valve just ruptured. You have to call in the whole team. And of course, if you get it wrong and the whole team comes in to operate on or something, you're the one who had all these people come from home from their sleep and it wasn't necessary. So I would wake up in the middle of the night during this month with palpitations and sweats in my bed at home when I wasn't even on call. Only time I experienced panic attack. That's what residency was for me. Thankfully, it's not like that. No. So if you guys are wanting to go into medicine, you're not going to be exposed right. to those horrible residency things. Yeah, I just there described. are actually now um, yes. laws in place to prevent that. <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, my, my residency experience was completely different. I, I, you, I don't know if you mentioned, but he went into emergency medicine as his residency, so that's a pretty yeah. intense. A little more field. intense, too. Uh, mine was family practice. I knew that from the get that I wanted to be a family doctor, so um, my uh, residency experience was a little better. Um, yeah, I only, at most, worked 80 hours a week. So. And, and you've been <laughs> seeing me in family medicine when you made that decision to go into family right. medicine. Right, yeah, yeah, you were. Yeah. Already yeah you yeah. actually worked for me. I did, I rotated the through. The summer. Uh, yeah, did a rotation out here. So, um, yeah, during medical school, I worked yep. in our office and did a little rotation yeah. of helping us room patients when we first opened up back in 2005. Yeah. yeah. Um, yes? Oh, no, so <clears throat> when you talk about um, firehose, yeah. since then, is there still a learning curve there? Are you still learning? Or you oh, still always learning. learning. Well, what's, oh, yeah. Sort of on your own? Training? Yeah, so there, there are um, Oh, we're going to do some today. Yeah, yeah. Well, you, um, you guys are going to do some of it with us Yeah, today. you can learn with us. Uh, and, and help us make yeah. a decision. So there are requirements each year to get continuing medical education. You need to get a certain amount of hours, um, both for your license, but then also for your board certification. Um, so, yeah, they're yeah. prescribed ones, and you can go to, you know, cool places and do it as well. But yeah, you gotta do that. Now that's uh, the prescribed stuff. That being said, um, every day I'm looking stuff up just to confirm stuff and learn new stuff, uh, and and just um, continue my education, make sure I'm doing a moving patch for my patients. So, so it's a never-ending process. If you if you like school, medicine's for you. <laughs> like I, I joke that if, if I could go to school and get paid for the rest of my life, that's totally what I do. I didn't <laughs> I didn't feel that way 
when I was in high school. I, I wanted to do whatever the four-year program is. was. If it's something you like, out. it's fun. So that's why I went with the, the broadcasting. You just like it was, literature. You know, you're not going to do anything beyond four years for that. Until I got to college and realized, wow, when it's something you're interested in, school can be really cool, and I enjoy learning. And that's when there was a change. And I said, yeah, I could do another four years of this afterwards because I love doing this. That's right. So you, like if Mr. you had that Schroeder's love for learning. For the rest of your life. Graduate school is great. <laughs> yeah. yeah. If you love stuff in this class, medicine may be for you. Yeah. Anything else? Other okay. questions? Or should, should we, we move on jump to on the list of questions? Is there a yeah. house? I guess you guys did. Do you guys want to ask questions. any questions in particular before we had the... Yes. What made you decide you were going to stay in the practice? Like, I know you said you already... I was in emergency medicine for two years, uh, working in an emergency department in Roseville. And during that time, the lifestyle was uh, rotating shifts. And it was a time in emergency medicine here in Placer and Sacramento counties where it was very busy. There was this thing called uh, closure where it was quite normal for us to close the emergency department which meant we wouldn't accept any ambulance traffic. Now, because we had different hospital sim systems where patients had insurance and they're supposed to be treated at a particular hospital, this caused real havoc at that time. So the patients would come to, here's how it works. Uh, super, super busy, not enough emergency departments to take all, and this is really in the summer, I think, when it got really bad, around 99 or 2000. Not enough facilities to take care of all of the medical emergencies that were going on in the area. So everybody would close. Well, you can't all close. The ambulances have to go somewhere. So then they would do something called round robin, where they would just rotate which emergency department the patients went to. So you're still getting the patients, but now Sutter Roseville is getting the Kaiser patient, and Kaiser is getting the Sutter Roseville patient. And they don't have the records, and it's not the place where the insurance takes care of them, so you would just stabilize the patient and then transfer them to the hospital they belonged in. So they, they said, no more of this closure business. You just have to deal with it uh, since that time. But when that was happening and we didn't have adequate facilities, it was really stressful. Uh, and you would stay for hours afterwards documenting uh, the patients and taking care of the ones you had started on but didn't want to pass off to the next shift because it was kind of complicated and you really felt like you needed to be the one to make the decisions about, you know, do they need to get admitted or when these labs come in, do we need to do a procedure? And also the rotating shifts where you're starting at eight in the morning for a few days in a row and then starting at three in the afternoon for a few days in a row and then starting at seven at night for a few days in a row, you know, covering the whole 24 hour period. That is very hard for some people's bodies to adapt to. And for me, I, I was one of those people that it just didn't work. And also I have this weird thing about my psychology that if I have something kind of hanging over my head later in the day, the whole day up to that is a countdown to that. So if I'm sitting with my kids watching Sesame Street with them, what's on my mind is not you know, how to count with Elmo. It's, all right, when, when, when do I need to get in the car and go? Okay, I got another 20 minutes, so. I was never 20 there. 20 minutes, ah, 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 ah. Yes. Ah. So I was, it just didn't work well for me. Uh, family medicine, much more relaxed. You, you get to know your <coughs> patients. Um, I felt like, <clears throat> some may argue with this, but I felt like I had people skills and that that was being wasted in a place where it doesn't matter what your personality is, the patients are stuck with you. So I, I felt good about going somewhere where I could have a, a, a panel of patients who came because they wanted me to help them with the health care based on a relationship. Uh, that's very important to me and, and that really fit, fit better with family medicine. Yes? In the emergency department? Yeah. At that time, there just weren't enough facilities for the amount of emergency medical care needing to be provided. Since then, many more beds have been added to local emergency departments. Uh, like, I went back to the, the department I, I worked in, and it was at least quadruple the size it was when I had worked there, uh, when I visited it, how many years later? Seven, 16 years later. Do you guys have, do you have a PA? We have three uh, advanced practice clinicians, two PAs and one nurse practitioner. And they are able to. Can you tell me a little bit about how that fits Oh, I'd love to. Um, I encourage people who are interested in medicine but, and would love to treat patients 
but don't want to take that jump to four years of medical school plus three plus years of residency after that, being a physician assistant is, uh, or a nurse practitioner, but physician assistant is kind of the most direct route, is a way that you can practice medicine, evaluate patients, come up with a treatment plan, uh, work closely with a doctor. We, the ones that we have in our office uh, will come to us throughout the day and say, hey, I've got this patient with, and they'll just go through the things. We may or may not actually see the patient or examine them ourselves, but we're there as kind of a sounding board for them, or in some cases, if it's a real difficult thing, just go ahead and kind of take over and say, yeah, this is what we should do. So able to practice medicine, but under close uh, physician supervision, uh, physician assistant is a great track after doing something very similar to a, a pre-med four-year plan in, in college, although maybe not quite as rigorous, getting into a physician assistant school and within two and a half years, you can be in a doctor's office and actually seeing your own patients. Yeah. Do you think that the, um, when you were in residency and stuff and the schedule and sleep deprivation on it, do you think that's affected you, you know, like for the rest of your life and stuff? Wow, long-term effects? I'm curious about that. Uh, well, yeah, yeah, I think any, any experience that is traumatic to the body or the psyche has a potential to affect the rest of your life. So whatever that learning experience is, a growing experience that you go through, whether it be medicine or not, uh, it, it, that's what shapes us, our experiences. Yeah. So yeah, that's probably why I'm the way I am. <laughs> Oh, there's, there's negative and positive, yeah. Um, hopefully, um, I'm a, uh, a person with empathy and able to really um, feel for what patients are going through and, and go, through the, with it, uh, go through it with them and treat them with compassion and provide them some comfort because of having gone through things I have. Um, at the same time, people can come out from the exact same experience, very jaded and uh, just totally unfeeling because that's what their experience was to it. They just, you know, cut it off and uh, choose not to have that feel because it, cause it was painful to go through. So it, it can go either way, as you can see here. <laughs> Who else had a question on our list of questions? Yes. Um, well, I guess, yeah, now would be the time to start. So, uh, one would be pick a good undergraduate school. That's important. Yes. Um, because not all of them are created equal. When, when you go to an undergraduate school, all of them will tote, tote, that's a word. They'll, what? they'll tell you. What? <laughs> man, they'll tell you that they have like a 90 something percent acceptance rate. To medical school. Uh, to medical school. Oh, and, um, and, and, yeah. And, and they'll all say that they're the best. Um, obviously not true. Not everybody can have that. Um, so uh, you got to do a little more digging and investigating there. Some of the smaller schools will still say that when it's not true. And the way they get that is they, they essentially weed out the people themselves. They say, oh, yeah, you're not going to go to medical school. <laughs> you're, you're, you don't want to. So, so everybody who actually applies to medical school are only the top of the top. So, um, and so that's one thing. The other, uh, other thing is um, there's a lot in a name. So, so schools that are well known uh, will get kind of shuffled to the top, as, uh, whereas those who are a little lesser known. Um, or just not get them. weeded out. Yeah, yeah. And some of them, yeah, you, if they've never heard of the school, you're not even going to get a second you know, chance at it. So um, the, the school I went to, Point Loma Nazarene, is not that well known. It's it got a pretty good relationship with the medical school I went to, and I think that's the only reason I got in because there's a relationship there. Everywhere else, I didn't even get an interview. I, I didn't get an interview at any of the top schools in um, California because of that, like Stanford, UCLA, USC, all of those. I didn't even get um, interviews on UC. oh, UCs are great. Yeah, yeah, UCs are, yeah, just about any UC, you know, is gonna get you yeah. a good education and, yeah. and they're gonna know. Um, Something I came across recently was actually getting a list of the medical schools yeah. they get people into. That tells you everything. Right, because so they're, they're just getting people into, you know, schools in the Caribbean. Those are a little less competitive versus, you know, like the top names, Harvard, Stanford, UCLA, 
you know, if they're getting people into those, you can be reassured that you're getting a good education. Yeah, if they're, if they're not willing to give you a list of the medical schools that their recent graduates have gone to, Red flag. look at the other schools <laughs> that will give you that list, that are proud of the places they're able to get their and then students into. Just ask, ask the admissions them. people yeah, yeah, when to direct you to somebody in the pre-health sciences yeah. advising. Uh, the, usually they'll have like a pre-med advisor. Yeah. And that person, even if they don't have a list they can give you, they can tell you the names of students and where they are because that's their job yeah. to, to get people into medical school. Yeah. And if they're not giving you top school names, if all they're giving you is just the state school for the state they're in and uh, yeah. some private schools in the Midwest, then you probably should be looking somewhere else. Yeah. 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 We, I just Especially did this just within the one. last three years. Yeah, uh, exactly. And I was comparing two different schools. Uh, well, I'll tell you what they were. It was Westmont College compared to, what's the Quaker school in Oregon? Oh, uh, mm -hmm. no, 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 it's, uh, it's a unique name. Um, anyway, anyways. the, the, the yeah, one in cool. Oregon was getting people into Oregon Health Sciences and Loma Linda University and Creighton. Whereas uh, Westmont was able to say, yeah, we got somebody into Duke, we got somebody into, I think it was uh, Johns Hopkins in Baltimore, um, and then some, I think even some of the UCs, they were getting people in UC medical schools. And that was just such a difference between those two lists that it was easy for me to tell Kara, oh, yeah, if, you're, yeah. if you're going for pre-health sciences, this Go is a better one. program. Another thing, real quick, um, when you get into medical school, the first two years are weeder years. They're going to try to weed out all the people who are not willing to make it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so one of those classes is called organic chemistry. Put your head down and study hard for organic chemistry. If you can make it through yeah. that, you can do anything. Or even just the introductory biology year. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Even where I those. went, it, it was the class that everybody who was pre-med they put them all in this one bucket to start with and squeezed really hard to squeeze out as many as yep. they could to make them drop out of the program, to yep. thin the herd so that then they could focus on the, the real valuable students who they knew had a chance of making it. Yeah. Kai? So how much is then getting into a good medical school, how much does that help? That you helps. You go to a good college to get to Right, medical. yeah, so, so it's just like kind of one step into the next. Um, so getting into a good medical school will then help you when you're applying for residency. Um, yep. So they, there are, you know, a, a high, there is a hierarchy of medical schools as well. Um, some are better than others. Um, and, and if you're looking at certain residency programs, they're going to pick up bigger names, even if you don't have as good of test scores. Um, so, Plus uh, interview. yeah, in interview. They, the, um, so the, the Caribbean schools usually aren't that good. It is, it is kind of a roundabout way to become a doctor. Um, but if you go to a Caribbean school, it is difficult to get into a residency in the United States. Um, so sometimes difficult to get licensed. Even. Yeah, right. Um, another thing is uh, MD versus DO schools. Now, for residency, some look at that. Not all of them do, but some do. Um, truly, I DO uh, is, is a four-year um, medical school that has a slightly different um, a program, I guess you would say. But but they are all, all, every DO takes all the with. same licenses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're all competent doctors. Doctor um, of osteopathy. Some residencies look down on yeah. that. So so it's just something to. They, they include a little bit of manipulation, you know, kind of like yeah. chiropractic kind of type of practice, integrated with pretty much everything else that we learned. Right. And so uh, my program, I think yours too. We had our, our residencies had medical doctors and doctors of osteopathy side by side doing the exact same thing. Yeah. Coming out with the same certificate and able to go out and do the exact same job. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if you know the, or not the answer to this, but uh, through the military, I know you can get a medical degree yeah. or you can become a physician. Would it be the same process or do they have their own special way of doing it? So it is the, uh, um, I actually looked into this. <laughs> um, but it, it is the um, same process. So there's two different ways you can do it. You can go through a military program where they have their own medical schools. Uniform Services Health yeah. Sciences University yeah. in Baltimore? Yeah, that's probably out there somewhere. Uh, or you can go to a regular, regular, a, a civilian um, medical school and just essentially get them to pay for your medical school and then trade time. Um, so usually it's year for year. So if you have them uh, pay for your medical school, then you owe them back a year for year. Exactly, and they, there is a minimum, I think, for years is the minimum. Um, it may be four. But um, 
And then usually if you do that, they want you to go to one of their residency programs. So, and, and you, you have to go through all the same training. You go to basic training, you do all the other um, stuff that you would need to go to, in the military. A word of caution, I had a classmate who was doing it through that track. And I saw him 10 years, 10 year reunion, uh, after we graduated from medical school, he had become an orthopedic surgeon and he had lawyers uh, for the purpose of trying to get him out of the army. He had fulfilled his obligation, but in the contract, when you are in the military, if it's a time of war and there is need, they actually have the power to not let you out. So uh, you have to be prepared for that. You know, the good that comes with it, there is a price, and that is you will serve your country in sometimes you know, situations that are not convenient. Yeah. yeah. Yep. So he, he, uh, he was in the sandbox serving and you know, working on soldiers in, in combat for years. Yeah. Connor. You can go to college and like major in something that's not like pre-med and still get in. Like Absolutely, school. and that's why I said earlier, um, being a uh, biochem double major, um, that was just what I saw. I was like, oh, that's what all the pre-med guys do, so that's what I want to do. But yeah, you can do anything you want. You can be a philosophy major, you can be an art major and still get into medical school. You just need to fulfill the requirements required by the medical school. And, they, and they're all posted, I mean, there's a- yeah, Typically, it's going to be a year of engineering physics. Some will require calculus. you to have calculus. Um, that all the biology classes. Two years of chemistry okay. with lab. Yeah. So it, it's easy to do it's it easy, with yeah. some kind of a science major. A little harder as a philosophy major. It is. But yeah. people do it. Yeah, people do do yeah. it. But. So like broadcasting as well. Yeah, they yeah. should have stayed, huh? <laughs> he could have done it, yeah, as a broadcast major, just fulfilled the requirements. Um, I don't think that med schools look any differently on your on what you graduated with. Being a uh, biochem major myself, some of those lower level first year medical school classes were maybe a little easier because I already had um, a basic knowledge of what was going on. Yeah. What about doing like a biology PA? Yeah, biology's great. Yeah, that's actually probably what most do. Um, biology is probably the main track for pre med. You, you don't need to be an overachiever and do chemistry as well. Although, when you look at the stats, a higher percentage of people who did chemistry as a major get accepted to bi uh, medical school than people who did biology as a major. I did not know that. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, people who do biology and chemistry are even higher percentage. <laughs> yeah. So you were in the best group. Well, we're yeah. crazy people in here. That's why. Well. Should we make this more interesting? Yeah, let's make this more interesting. Um, so we uh, came prepared with an injury that we wanted to, um, well, not me. We came prepared with an injury. We were wrestling the other day. No. <laughs> uh, so so every, he's, a, he's a creature of habit, so I know what he wears every single day of the week. So it, it was a Friday, so I just decided to dress like him. <laughs> you don't know everything I wear. But no, no. <laughs> <laughs> yep, so tell them about your injury well, well, or what's going on. Okay, so the doctor asks, what, what's the problem? What's been going on? So we should probably tell everybody also, not only you guys, but also all the people watching live. There are some people writing, they're writing comments to each other and having conversations. Th this is where we get into the actual shoulder fun. injection part. What, what the fun part? Oh, no, there's 20. Well, now there's 20. Okay. Tell your friends. So um, my shoulder has been hurting and particularly I notice it being a problem with taking off my lab coat at work. I, I can't take, I have to push it off because I, I can't manipulate my shoulder for it to slide off like it used to. Uh, something else I've noticed is sleeping in bed at night. I like to lay down like this and it hurts in the shoulder and even actually radiates down the arm a little bit when I do that. So it's kind of disruptive of sleep to have this shoulder ache. Uh, so with that, is that enough information on history? Um, no prior operations, no prior injury. Any weakness. No sudden things. And I'm not noticing any weakness, just that I can't get certain, you know, make certain movements. Um, so I guess you should do an exam. Any injury? Did you injure it at some point? No. Okay. Yeah. Should I 
Um, so yeah, Should I when, we, when, uh, when you come into a doctor's office, we go through a, a basic process. So one is history, and actually you can make most of your diagnosis based on the history. And the history is, um, go for it. Um, <laughs> the history is uh, just asking what the, essentially the story is that brought them there. So, so that's kind of what we were getting to there. Uh, second part of the exam, or of, of coming to a doctor's office, is the physical exam. Yeah, and that's sure. where we actually um, See, here check, I am. I'm check them out. I'm doing it. I'm yeah, so we, it. and, and, it, and when you're examining a joint, it's good to actually yeah. see the joint. So <laughs> I am sorry that he needs to show you. Hashtag 420. <laughs> Hashtag what? <laughs> he said see the joint. <laughs> <laughs> Do, do any of my you know followers you even that. get that? Yeah, yeah. I, I don't. I don't know if any of them even get that. It's mostly women in their fifties and sixties. You guys learned the anatomy of the shoulder yet? So that's probably the first thing we should go over. Yeah, where's the? Where's our? Maybe if you throw out some things, yeah, you get closer. Yeah, it's, it's it's awkward to take shirts off. The, sh the shoulder is not. So, turning the way. Have have you done like you did on? He's such a good son. We've done the the muscles and added a couple. So, so the shoulder is an interesting joint. It's not like a knee. Um, so, so there's a lot of uh, different movement a shoulder can do, and that makes it pretty useful and handy, but that also makes it where a lot of things can go wrong. So a knee's pretty easy. It works in one plane, right? So not a lot can go on. You've only got four ligaments stabilizing it there. You've got muscles above and below, and, and you, you move it. Um, so, so the exam's pretty easy to diagnose things on the knee. It's, you know, there's a few number of things you can see. The shoulder, there's actually a lot more. So the shoulder works in a, um, all, all planes. So let's go over some basic um, movement. So, so when your, your arm's at your side, um, extension is when you extend your arm this way. And it should go back. And here, let's compare them about how well I do it versus how extension. Once you get there, uh, um, I feel it a little bit like. Sorry, that's flashing. Did I say extension? Extension is this way. You should be able to go all the way up to 180 degrees. I disagree. I say this is extension. And this is that is extension? Not That's not flexion. Depends what you. <laughs> what's what's um, the teacher say? Is this all just rotating? Yeah. yeah. This is rotating. Um, it's it's a little different. In the shoulder, we don't really say rotation. 90 degrees yeah. flexion. Yeah, and then there's abduction and add, extension. Adduction. 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 You're right. That's extension. I was adduction. So so yeah, abduction is out. A B. Book, and then adduction is across AD. your chest. Yeah, they sound a lot alike, so often we'll say abduction or deduction. Um, and then rotation is one. So, so internal and external rotation, if you put your elbow at your side, you should be able to rotate out um, about that much. And then we test an internal rotation by putting your arm behind your back and seeing how far up you can go. So some people are really good at that. They can like, touch their fingers and stuff, not me. Um, so, how's, how's your internal okay, rotation so, when we compare them? So, um, the internal rotation on the so the, on the good the, side, the control. It's the good side. And, and the, the nice thing is God gives us two so we can compare, usually. It does not get as far as you can see. He's a little limited there. You can help it out all you want. <laughs> um, so, he's not able to internal rotate as, as far on that side. So, there is a little limitation. So, so that is the, the um, first part. Well, first part of the exam is actually looking at it, but that's all the different range of motion that you test out. A little bit of shoulder horn rotation, aren't you? Are you just finding this out now? All right, good. <laughs> just have a little limitation there. That's what we're doing. Yeah. Um, and then you want to actually look at the shoulder too. Some people say they have shoulder pain, and you look and you do all these things. You're like, it's not the joint. You've got a rash on your shoulder, you know, or some skin thing. So you actually need to shingles, visualize. Yeah. yeah, visualize joint shingles is a is a common one that we'll see. But that's yeah. Shoulders, but it's not that. Um, I don't think you have any skin abnormalities now. Um, and then let's go through some basic anatomy as we go through it. So, so the uh, <laughs> the shoulder consists of a few different bones. Um, so the only place that the shoulder actually connects to the rest of the skeleton is through the clavicle. Um, so the clavicle starts at the uh, sternoclavicular joint right here, and you can kind of follow it. You can feel it. You guys probably feel it on yourself. Follow your clavicle all the way out, and you'll get to a little point on the outside where there's where it connects to the acromion. Right there, right? Yeah, uh, and the acromion is uh, part of the scapula. The scapula is the wing bone right on the back there. Um, I probably should use technical terms, wing bone. You guys are advanced. You don't need terms like that, right? 
So the, the scapula um, is right right there. That's got that's what houses all of your rotator cuff um, muscles, uh, and we'll talk about those. And then the scapula has a uh, little fossa, which is the um, socket uh, of the ball and socket joint, which then I know I, the name. Yeah, is where the um, socket. Right. What is the name of that What's joint? Do you guys know? There you go. Yeah. See, so what's the name of that joint? So when we put those two together, it's the glenohumeral joint. Yeah, yeah. With joints, we just usually name them by what's connecting. It's pretty easy. Uh, so so the, um, the fossa here is actually not a full socket. Um, it's actually pretty shallow. So um, there is an extension that comes out um, to make it a... What are you doing? <laughs> uh, so <laughs> there's an extension that comes out that, to make it a little more grippy or a little more round for that, that ball to fit into. Does anybody know the name of that? Mm, no. What? No. 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 Maybe you guys haven't learned this. Uh, the labrum. Do you guys have you heard that term? So it's. So uh, you can't so see it here because it's a soft tissue. It's not a bone. Yeah. It's soft tissue that extends beyond that called the labrum. Um, you can get a, a, a tear of that, the labral tear, um, which can be terribly debilitating, especially if you're a pitcher. Um, so uh, so that, that kind of holds it in place. And then... Labral tears can be debilitating too. <laughs> yeah, I had to go. <laughs> Glad they couldn't hear um, so, so the, uh, the rotator cuff is, is the main stabilizing uh, muscle and um, uh, tendons of the joint. Do you know the four rotator cuff muscles? Do we know that one? Oh, yeah. We haven't learned it in the first place. Yeah. All right, okay. Oh. All right, yeah, we'll, 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 uh, we'll point of truth comes out. All right. Yeah, so. <laughs> <laughs> Fail them. It's not a 500 level anatomy. Yeah. yeah. So, so the um, scapula is here. If you can feel back here, you, you can feel the bone uh, called the spinous process of, of the scapula. You can feel that, right? Um, so we've got these names that actually make sense. Um, there's a muscle right above that called the supraspinatus. Supra above, spine, oh, supraspinatus. Yes, yeah, so it's right in there. Kind of goes through. Um, and then underneath that, what do you think we call the one that's below the spinous process? Infra. Infraspinatus. Very there good. Go. Um, and then we've got the scapula. What do you think is the uh, name of the one that's right under the scapula? Right here. Very close. Subscapularis is the, is the name of it. Uh, and then, yeah, it all attaches like they um, have all this. And then there's one more one, two, three. called Terry's Minor, um, which is right down here at the bottom. Um, and it helps uh, with adduction. Yeah, would be my guess. Yep. The, um, we stay stay. So, uh, so those are all the muscles. So we have some special tests we can do to, to isolate and test each of those muscles to see if there is a tendonitis or um, a tear. Heaven forbid. Heaven forbid. Um, but one of the other things that you can get with uh, in the shoulder is um, a bursitis. Do you guys know what a bursitis is? Have you heard that term before? Bursitis. So, it's yeah. like a little thin sac. Yeah. Yes, yeah. excellent. Fluid filled sac. Perfect, yeah, it's a fluid filled sac that decreases inflammation when rubbing. Um, so, you have them all over. Anywhere there's um, uh, a lot of rubbing, you're, you're going to have them. So, the shoulder is one of those areas. Lots of, you know, the, those, four ro <laughs> those four rotator cuff tendons as, as they sit, sit like this. Uh, there's a lot of stuff, a lot of pulling, moving, manipulating that humerus. So right underneath that, and right kind of almost in between it, is this uh, bursa sac. And bursitis is, itis just means inflammation. So anytime you hear itis, tonsillitis, other itis, uh, senioritis. means senioritis, inflammation of the senior. Um, <laughs> Uh, that just means inflammation. So, so that, that, that fluid-filled sac is just inflamed, and, and sometimes it can even fill with fluid and cause reduced range of motion. So, so there are a few tests we can do for that. The one is called the NEARS test, where you put your arm at your side, you put your hand forward, and I stabilize the, make sure the um, scapula is stable, and you just lift your hand up. And you've got 
pretty good range of motion. Any pain when you do that? No. no. So, so often if it's a really bad um, bursitis, which is also called impingement syndrome, they'll go up to a point and they'll just say, I can't go anymore. And then you say, hi. No, we can't say that. Um, <laughs> uh, so, so this is called the near sign. People, uh, yeah, it, always a bad joke. in social media. Yeah, probably. yeah. We're social media. No hashtags there. Um, so, <laughs> so, so that's one. There's another test called the Hawkins sign. These are all named after people that um, I never remember the names of, but only in some cases. Um, but the Hawkins, uh, the Hawkins, for some reason I remember because I do it every time. So you pull your, this up, flex here, and what we're going to do is pull across, almost to where he's touching his other I shoulder. See. Yes, yeah, and you rotate down, and then you kind of push over. Does that hurt when I, feel, I do that? I feel a little bit. And you're kind of holding up the elbow as you do that. So what that's doing, it's kind of hard to tell, but what we're doing is uh, rotating and pushing, and you can see that there's. Ah. A little pinching right that's happening right underneath the acromion there. That's Somebody said they knew the acromion. That's the acromion right there. Uh, so so there, there's pinching that goes on there. And then also same thing with the near sign. As you go up, there's swelling in there. So you hit a spot where it just doesn't want to go anymore. Um, so often older people, I'm sure you've seen these, like, like older people, they say they, they can only get their arm up so far. Like so it's hard for them to do their hair. They're like, yeah, they always talk about their hair. Yeah, yeah. One of my uh, professors used to say, there's two things you should be able to do when you have a shoulder injury. One, your hair. Two, wipe your bottom. So if they're not able to do those, yeah, they, they, they don't have enough uh, shoulder range of motion. All right. So those are the tests for uh, impingement syndrome. So now we'll start testing for those rot rotator cuff tendons. So um, first one, uh, supraspinatus is the most common. So what I'll do is have you Hold out your arms like this, like you're holding, you can either thumbs up or like you're holding two sodas. <laughs> so you want to be about 45 degrees. And what, what I'm going to do is just push down to test his strength here. It's hard to do. I, I, I feel like I'm getting in, in their way. So you push down. His strength is fine. Super spinatus. It's doing its job. Yeah, he's doing his job. Now you can isolate that even further if you put your thumbs down. And we'll, we'll test it that as well. So this is the empty can test. Yep. <laughs> yeah, full can, empty can. Makes sense. That's actually the name of the test. It's not somebody's name. Uh, Terry's minor, we can test by pushing across the body for abduction. Push across, that's pretty good. We can compare it always. Yeah, it's the same. Um, and then for um, subscapularis, arm behind the back, internal rotation like we said. You can push off for, this is the good side and the bad side. That you can't get up there, push, push. He's got no, not much strength there. So, so we've isolated it there. So, where's the, what's going on? Anybody? So can anybody tell me now? Yeah, you guys want to actually test? You guys can do this we'll test. All the way around like talks. This is called the lift off test. It's got somebody's name too. What's the name of the guy? Uh, here? Gerber. Gerber test. Um, yes. Yeah, lift off test. So there is some some weakness there. So that is which muscle that we're testing again? Subscapularis. subscapularis. So he's got a subscapularis tendonitis, or tear. No, just weakness. You don't have any pain when you do that, right? No. Yeah. So he'll go around. Oh. <laughs> were you all the way there? Yeah, push. Oh, no, she doesn't want to push. I think you were. Uh... <laughs> you fixed them. <laughs> yeah. They'll never be okay. You just got to walk around. You guys can actually see on, the, on this, uh, on where all those uh, connect. It's actually pretty, a pretty good representation. So the question is, once we find this, what in the world are we going to do about it? Um, you guys are the doctor. What do you think you're going to do? Send them home. <laughs> take two aspirin. Call me in the morning. Ice it. So where are you going to ice? Oh, you've done it. If you've isolated the subscapular, if you've isolated that, it's the subscapularis. Yeah, the tough thing is that subscapulation is underneath the, the um, scapula, right? Yeah. Well, inject ice. <laughs> inject ice. There you go. Um, ice is not a bad idea, though, because, because that tendon does come up and go around. So if it's a tendonitis, you can still ice the tendon without messing with the muscle. So yeah, good, good idea, ice. A steroid injection. We'll talk about that. That's a, that's a great um, suggestion. Um, anybody else? What else would you do? Okay, 
So, so here's the thing that I'm sure you've heard before, RICE. Have you heard of that? Anybody know what that stands for? It stands for something, RICE, not just something you eat. There you go, yeah, yeah. So rest, ice, compression, elevation. Um, newer, newer stuff, we actually extend it and call it price for certain things. The P stands for protection. So if you have an injury, often you want to protect it with like a splint or something like that. Um, so, so rest, ice, compression. So rest, we talked about ice. Rest is a little difficult for this one because you use your arm all the time, but you can get them in a sling, try to rest it for a while, see if stop moving it can reduce some of the inflammation in the shoulder. Um, compression, uh, can't really do that on this side. That, uh, b because the shoulder is such a weird joint and there's things behind there, you can't really wrap. You're not going to wrap this whole torso to, to help out with it. Um, and then elevation, it's at the level of the heart, so you don't really need to do that. So that's often for the, uh, the lower extremities and the arms just to and get them up there. Um, so somebody said injection, cortisone injections. What do you know about cortisone injections? Okay. So, um, close. So, so the steroid, yeah, no, no, I, I, that's why I was, I was asking. I was just curious what you, what you knew or had, had learned about it. So a steroid actually does not build muscle. Um, steroid is just a potent anti-inflammatory, very potent. Um, sometimes we even give uh, steroids by mouth for certain conditions that need, like, need it through your whole body. Somebody has like a horrible rash that we're, topicals aren't going to work for, we're going to give them a pill to help out with that. Um, certain inflammatory conditions like rheumatoid arthritis that are throughout the whole body, we sometimes will give um, a steroid for. It. Um, or is it, if it's in a place where we can't get a steroid like the lungs, sometimes we'll give a steroid for that. Like asthma, somebody has a horrible case of asthma uh, and they're not getting better, then we'll, we'll give them by mouth steroids. Now, this is um, the steroid we use for um, a joint, a joint injection. Now, we're not technically injecting into the joint because um, that's the glenohumeral joint, right? And that's actually kind of hard to get into. You can do it, but often we want to do it with uh, guidance like an ultrasound or, or CT scan. Um, so what we want to do is try to get uh, in it, uh, an injection into the area where the, um, the itis, the inflammation is going on. So it's the tendon which is right up above the um, humerus, uh, right below the uh, chromium. Now, the question is, do we need to use a steroid? We maybe get relief without using a steroid. Um, and that's where we, we're going to kind of walk you through the process of what we do every day, learning stuff. So, you're up. Can we put that cut and paste up on the screen? Yeah. So, this is how we practice medicine. In 2018, we have a subscription to a overpriced product called Up to Date, and uh, when we pay that enormous fee every year, uh, it allows us to each have a license to get to this service. So this is this is the real Doctor Google, right? So in Up to Date, I was looking for the supraspinatus tendonitis, or actually pretty much just any rotator cuff uh, therapy, specifically looking at this idea of putting steroids in, and we found a little review of the literature. When we, when we say literature in medicine, we're talking about research papers, studies that have been done on a particular question about treatment. And this one was talking about the use of glucocorticoids. That's steroids like this. This is a glucocorticoid. <coughs> and this little paragraph that was looking at some different studies, I'll read it out loud. Although subacromial, under the chromium, glucocorticoid injection is a common treatment for rotor, rotator cuff disorders, we can tell you it is very common in our, each of our practice. We, we're doing these shots definitely weekly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, clear evidence of benefit is lacking. We believe it is reasonable to treat patients whose symptoms do not improve after several weeks of conservative management, including physical therapy, or whose pain prevents them from participating in physical therapy with a single injection of a glucocorticoid combined with an analgesic, something that treats pain. 
or just simply something that numbs it up. Um, analgesic could be as simple as Tylenol. The general role of glucocorticoids in the treatment of chronic overuse tendinopathy is discussed separately. And this, th this didn't come from an overuse thing. This just kind of came out of nowhere. Once a st systematic review found only a small benefit from injection at four weeks, meaning four weeks after the injection, it showed some benefit still, compared with placebo and no benefit over non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Somebody name it and said for me. There you go, ibuprofen. Another systematic review confirmed these findings and concluded there is little evidence to support the use of steroid injection in rotator cuff tendinopathy. Conversely, yet another systemic review found that subacromial injection for rotator cuff tendonitis was more effective than NSAIDs. Authors of all these reviews found the available studies to be small and of variable quality, often lacking clear outcome measures making it difficult to draw clear conclusions. One double-blinded, who, who can explain double-blinded? Yes? Uh, basically, the pa uh, patient and the doc neither the patient nor the doctor knows who's getting the drug and who gets the drug. Yes, exactly. So that's a good study because you're, you're com no uh, controlling for the placebo effect. One double-blinded randomized trial found no difference in function or symptoms in patients injected with beta-methasone, which is similar to this, and xylocaine, which is similar to the anesthetic we're using, compared with those injected with xylocaine alone, suggesting that glucocorticoids provide no additional benefit. What it's not saying is that all the benefit just came from numbing it up temporarily, uh, because that's what this does. It's a local anesthetic that numbs it up. And its effect is immediate, and the effect of the corticosteroid takes days to have take effect. And you'll notice that one study said at four weeks, the reason it says at four weeks is because there's lots of things you can do to somebody that make them feel better for a period of time. But what real value is it if a month later they're right back where they were before? So that's why they're saying at four weeks, it's been given time for any immediate or short-term effect to have died off, and whatever's left is like a long-term real treatment or um, cure. Steroid injection may reduce pain. All right, let's start here. A systematic review assessing the value of physical therapy in the treatment of shoulder pain found some evidence to suggest that glucocorticoids may provide greater benefit compared to physiotherapy or physical therapy alone. Steroid injection may reduce pain, thereby enabling earlier participation in range of motion exercises and rehabilitation. So, this is, yeah, Connor. Um, the second to last paragraph there, so it doesn't say if that was a difference in functional symptoms like right after they injected it or like later? Yeah, it doesn't tell us, does it? Yeah. It's not clear on this. We'd have to actually go to the original article ourselves okay. and read to see what's the answer to that question. Good pickup. So when we're in the patient room, this is about as much as we have time to go over, and then we need to make a decision. With the patient, this is what the evidence shows. This is the best we have as far as studies on this particular unique topic, what do you want to do? And so I present to you, does Dr. Gwain include the steroid when he gives me this shot or not? So, yeah, Connor. Have you tried physical therapy? That's yeah. Great question. Uh, yes, thank great you. Question. Uh, I have been doing therapy at home, did therapy as regularly as I could, didn't quite get to doing the exercises. I had some elastic bands, and I was doing some exercises with internal and external rotation. Um, that was the main thing that I did. Um, actually, I was doing it on both sides. And did that somewhat regularly for probably a month's time. And it, it didn't get better. If anything, it may have gotten a little worse. So with that, we'll have a show of hands. How many raise their hand to include the steroid in the injection? Based no, on yes, it, it what's written here. I will, I will. All right, and raise of hands. How many say do not give the shot with this based on what we like, read there? You didn't even know. <laughs> wow. Have you, have you tried like this? How about you write it down? We don't need it. I know. Not you're for a prolonged course. I, I, I actually like, I like Connor's suggestion here yeah. that I go with the NSAIDs for a period of time and don't get a shot today. That's an option too. I, mean, I wanted to give you a shot today. But <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah. Had I read this earlier, we may not be doing this today. He really knows what's going on. Yeah. So um, I can tell you how I would work through this. Um, uh, Please. With my experience as well. Like so so um, yes, there, so there are a few things in here that we don't know, like how close that is with, with, with the um, xylocaine and beta methadone. Uh, and then also with up here, four weeks out, I don't, they don't really, um, they say that the uh, conservative management, like the physical therapy, did they do the glucocorticoid with physical therapy or was it just on its own compared to physical therapy? I would think that probably a steroid combined with physical therapy is probably going to be your best bet. Now, now here's why. Um, that's just based on my knowledge of what this medication does. If we p place a, um, a numbing medication in his shoulder, what's it going to do? It's going to numb it, and then it's going to wear off after eight hours. That's about how long this one does. Now, what's that going to do for the long term? Well, it says it may do something, but... Um, but based on what numbing medication usually does, probably not a lot. If we place a steroid in there, um, it t takes a while to kick in, usually 48 hours. But, um, and we do with the numbing stuff too. So, so straight out the gate, um, we're gonna, he may have some increased range of motion because he's able to work through some pain that's not, no longer there. Um, now, pain's not your, your huge issue, right? It's more, maybe a little with your... Well, pulling it off. To, to be able to lay down and sleep without yep. having to wake up. Um, so, so the numbing will help with that, but it's going to wear off, and tomorrow that may be back. Um, the the long-term effects, so so my thinking is if we place a steroid in there, we can decrease the um, uh, inflammation in the area, and then that should ha be able to get him back to a more normal range of motion, more normal body mechanics, which then will prevent the inflammation from coming back. Um, if it's such a sure thing, why isn't it showing up in the story? Right. Oh, I didn't say it was a sure thing. <laughs> the, um, so this is, the, again, uh, a lot of what we do is not exact science. So that, that's what makes medicine so fun and so hard um, because we have to do critical thinking every day. You know, uh, that's what, you know, we're trying to teach you how to do it in, in high school here. We use it every day. Um, so, and everything has risks. So let's talk about the other side. So what, what are the risks of placing a um, numbing medication in his shoulder? Can you get it worse? You can't feel it? You're right. You could. Okay. So, so you can't feel it for... Now, now we're going to place a numbing medication even if we do the, um, uh, the steroid. But yes, you're right. If you can't feel anything, oh yeah, I can do this, rip something, tear something. Yes, that's a risk. Um, any other risks? Uh, we're, uh, let's assume that our two options are um, giving a steroid with this, the uh, numbing or just the numbing alone. Both of them have the same risk of a needle going in your shoulder. All right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So they, they both have that risk. That, there is a small risk there. Um, again, we do these injections often. So, so that risk is pretty small. And there's a big area that we're going into with the, um, the subacromial space. We're not going into a small joint. So, so it's tough to miss that area. Um, what are the risks of giving a steroid? Yeah. Can you be allergic to yeah, absolutely. People can be allergic to numbing medication too, to so that, that's there. But that is an added risk because we're giving you an extra medication there. So allergic reaction, yes. Is it like you can't get like a vein or something? You're right. Well, you don't want to inject anything into into a vein or, or artery. We're not anywhere near an artery, but a vein, yes. So we always what we do is we pull back to make sure we're not in a vein. Or a nerve. Or a nerve, yes. Yeah, and when we're in there, actually, by how quick the uh, medication goes in, you can tell where you're at if you're in a tendon, if you're in a nerve. So um, that just takes experience to, to know that. Um, yes? I uh, guess like most medications are part of the body that uh, process. So if you have kidney yeah. infection. You're right. Yeah, kidneys are the big one for that. Um, and it can be hard on the body locally. So when you're, when you're putting that um, steroid in there um, and it is working to decrease inflammation, it can actually weaken your tendons in the long term. So um, on rare occasion, repeat injections, usually not with one, but repeat injections can um, cause a complete tear uh, and loss of function of a, of a tendon. So that, that is a true risk to consider. So, so there, there's what I have placed. So what do you think we should do with all that knowledge? Do, do the vote again. 
So let's let's do a vote. Do you have more to add or? I have a question. Yeah. Have you had injections like in the past? Or? Mm, never. Great question. Yeah. Has he had any reactions before? Yeah. We always want to know that. Well, I've had steroid shots without reactions. I don't think any of them were beta methadone or. Uh, like how they did for your shoulder again? Or the not for the shoulder, no. Not for shoulder, and not for yeah. years. Now, strangely, um, uh, they happen, but um, allergic reactions to steroids are pretty uncommon because you treat them with steroids. That's what we treat them with, <laughs> steroids. <laughs> <laughs> so the, yeah, the treatment's kind of built. Did you have another question, or were you ready to vote? All right, so let's vote. So who wants? So we're giving an injection. You guys aren't walking out here without that. We'll still do something. All right. So how many options so two, two options. One is to give an injection with um, just the lidocaine, and one is with the, um, the steroid and the lidocaine. So who wants to do it with just the lidocaine, the numbing medication? They all want you to break your tendon. Okay. <laughs> Dude, not, so, so the other uh, option is the injection with the lidocaine and the methylprednisolone. Oh, man. Did you get a vote? I was convinced the other way. <laughs> all right, we'll do it. All right, so let's do it. This is your thing. Did, did I muddy the waters and convince them to do something? I thought that hearing about all the tendinopathy from it would they'd go, no, oh, that in case it needs no. an operation. Uh, yeah. But you said well, the numbing medication, there's really no point. Just don't do it. <laughs>